It's a waiting game. Wherever he is now, sooner or later, he's going to end up right here. Hey everyone, and welcome to What Did I Miss? Where today I'll be breaking down the fifth episode of the sixth season of Better Call Saul and looking for all the Easter eggs and references that you may have missed. I think that stress is the central theme of this entry of the series, as it appears that we follow how each of the surviving cast members are dealing with the stresses in their lives. Not only are Kim and Jimmy in the spotlight, but also Gus and even Howard are forced to take action in order to regain control over their circumstances. But before I get into the episode, I want to thank you for clicking on this video and ask that if you do enjoy it to please hit that like button to help support the channel. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell for weekly videos. The title of the episode is Black and Blue, and this is the first Better Call Saul episode to share a name with an episode of Breaking Bad, albeit in a different language, as the seventh episode of the second season of that series was called Negro y Azul, which is Spanish for Black and Blue. Negro y Azul is also the name of the song that the band plays in the intro to that episode. Coincidentally, that episode of Breaking Bad aired one week after the episode Peekaboo, which featured that shocking ending to the infamous character Spooge. This same character also appeared in last week's episode of Better Call Saul. The beginning of the episode shows a slide rule being encased in loose sight, with the words in Liebe dung Jungs, I'm sorry if my German is horrible, written on it. These words translate to English as, with love, your boys. And this memento was given to the wife of Werner Ziegler after he was killed in the fourth season episode, Winner. Werner often referred to the men working for him as his boys or good boys when discussing them with Mike, showing how he cared for them. This is not the first token of affection we have seen encased in Lucite in the Breaking Bad universe, as the grill of Tuco Salamanca was also encased in Lucite and given to Hank after Hank shot and killed him in the aptly titled second season episode, Grilled. After the intro, we see that Kim is unable to sleep after learning that Lalo is still alive from Mike last episode. Jimmy wakes up and finds her alone with the door barricaded. Even after Jimmy makes a remark about being glad that Lalo is dead, Kim decides not to correct him. If you recall, it was a big deal to Kim the past two seasons that Jimmy be honest with her about what danger he is in, so it's interesting that she chooses not to return the favor here. If and when Jimmy learns that Lalo is alive, and that Kim has known about it for some time, this may be something that causes an issue between them in the future. Gus is also worried about the eventual return of Lalo, and in my opinion, he has a lot more to worry about than Kim and Jimmy do. Everyone handles stress in their own way, and Gus looks to become obsessive and compulsive about cleanliness when he is stressed. In the fifth season episode, Namaste, we saw Gus make an employee at Los Pollos Hermanos named Lyle clean the fryers over and over again while he nervously waited for a call in his office. In fact, in this scene, if you look closely, you can see the return of Lyle as Gus walks through the kitchen and Lyle does not take his eyes off of Gus the whole time. Gus decides to wait on a customer and in doing so promotes their signature spice curls, which he also introduced to a board meeting of Madrigal executives last season in the episode JMM. In another part of New Mexico, the residents at a retirement community run by Sandpiper Crossing are listening to a presentation about their case by Aaron Brill. Miss Brill is an associate at Davison, Maine, who did not exactly get along with Jimmy during his time there and was introduced in the second season episode, Switch. Howard is also there with Clifford, Maine, who was also introduced in that same episode. Clifford notices that Howard is nervous and takes this as a sign of his drug use. In the last episode, Cliff mentioned that his son also had a drug problem. I'm sure you've heard something about my son's drug problem. Gregory's struggle gave me a more, let's say, personal view of the legal system. I'm not sure if Kim or Jimmy knew about Cliff's son being an addict beforehand, but if they did, it was a very clever way to get Cliff concerned about what is going on with Howard. After the elderly audience starts to become unruly, Howard steps up and nails the presentation. I think that the scene is important for understanding the character of Howard Hamlin. As we see here, that when he gets stressed or witnesses a situation spiraling out of his control, he takes the reins and deals with it. This also foreshadows how he decides to try and deal with Jimmy later this episode after Howard is able to deduce that Jimmy is messing with his life. In the next scene, we see the return of Francesca arriving at Jimmy, aka Saul's, new office. Francesca Liddy first appeared as Saul Goodman's receptionist in the Breaking Bad episode titled Better Call Saul, and then returned on this series in the third season episode Witness. It was pretty obvious that Francesca liked working with Kim more than Jimmy, but Jimmy is able to get her to stay after offering her a lot more money. Francesca was also able to get Walt to give her $20,000 after he first offered her $1,700 after he broke the door to their office in the Breaking Bad episode Face Off. At her office in the El Camino dining room, 
Kim meets with Viola, who was her paralegal, and helped with the Mesa Verde case. When Kim left her job at Schweikert and Coakley in the fifth season, she remarked that she would hire Viola again in the episode titled Something Unforgiven. Although it looks like this friendly meeting between the two was really arranged so that Kim could learn the name of the judge presiding over the Sandpiper Crossing case. Saul goes to meet a client late at night, but it turns out that the client is actually Howard Hamlin, who sets up a boxing match between the two. In the end, it is Howard that gets the final knockdown, but in real life, I'm not sure that this fight would have gone the same way. In this picture here, you can see the cast and crew after the scene, and if you notice, there is a stuntman there for Patrick Fabian, the actor who plays Howard Hamlin, but none for Bob Odenkirk, who I would like to point out is older than Mr. Fabian. That's because Bob Odenkirk spent the two years prior to filming this season of Better Call Saul training for and filming the movie Nobody, in which he plays a retired assassin who proceeds to beat the crap out of almost everyone he comes across. So props to Bob Odenkirk for making himself into a badass well into his 50s. You may have also noticed in this picture another actor from the Breaking Bad universe, and that is Luis Moncada, who plays Marco Salamanca, one of the cousins. Before you start building your own theories, Mr. Moncada was there specifically to help coordinate the fight scene, as besides being a working actor, he is also a boxing instructor. After the fight, it appears that Howard has hired a private investigator of his own to look into Jimmy. This could have huge ramifications for the season, because if this PI is able to find out that Jimmy is working for the cartel and what is going on there, it may put an even larger target on everyone, including Howard. Since Mike is also following Kim and Jimmy, hopefully he is able to steer this PI clear before he finds out anything too dangerous. Jimmy receives a pretty good shiner after his encounter with Howard, and he tries to cover it up with makeup, which is something that we have seen Walt, Jesse, and Mike all do as well after their own mishaps. During their discussion about the fight, Kim tells Jimmy that the shiner is a good look and that he should use the phrase, I'm Saul Goodman and I'll fight for you, which is something that we see Saul using as a tagline during Breaking Bad. Mike returns to the house where Gus is living at and explains to him that they still cannot find Lalo. Gus insists that he is still alive, and Mike says that if he is, then he will eventually find him. The fact that Gus is so sure that Lalo is alive leads me to believe that eventually, Gus will be the man to kill him thanks to what we know happens to this character in Breaking Bad. This is because of what Gus says to Hector Salamanca in this scene from the Breaking Bad episode Crawl Space, which takes place years after this moment in the season. Now, the Salamanca name dies with you. As sure as Gus is that Lalo is alive, is just as sure as he is when he tells Hector here that all the Salamancas are dead once Hector dies. So this has to mean that Gus will either kill Lalo or be there when Lalo is killed, since no one would be able to convince Gus that Lalo Salamanca was dead otherwise in his paranoid state. Gus and Mike return to the work site, which will be the underground meth lab that Walt and Jesse work in later for Gus. The site itself has not been worked on since the death of Warner Ziegler in the fourth season. At a bar in Germany, a woman sits by herself until she is joined by none other than Lalo, who reappears after being absent the last three episodes. Lalo was obviously able to track her down after learning Werner Ziegler's name last season and becoming obsessed with finding him. Gus gave Lalo and Juan Bosa a reasoning as to why Ziegler was killed and who he was, which of course was a lie, in the fifth season episode Magic Man. But this did not deter Lalo from finding out more about him and Gus's secret project. Lalo is able to enter her house after she leaves, and he finds the slide rule in Lucite that we saw during the intro of this episode. He also finds a sticker on the bottom from the manufacturer, which he will use to find the men who purchased it. The same men who worked for Werner and that know about Gus and the lab. Once Gus learns about this, there will be a race to find and silence the men before Lalo gets to them. There are six men in total that work for Werner Ziegler, and not all of them were shown to be happy as to how things ended. So if Lalo finds the right person, they may just give him the information he is looking for. Well that was everything I saw, but let me know in the comments if I missed anything. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please hit that like button if you have enjoyed it, and I will see you next time on What Did I Miss?